Indiana just lost the Hoosier State Passenger Rail Service, and while we lament its loss, this gives us the opportunity to look into why this happened and why the US has not caught up with the rest of the world. Now this year, there seems to be a change in the way Americans think about high-speed rail. NBC just put out a video about high-speed rail and it's garnered millions of views. You also have the Hyperloop honeymoon now finally coming to an end. And the best of all is Virgin Brightline has been making the rounds around national media on the possibility of a working transportation system. For those of you new to the channel, welcome aboard. We're now over 13,000 subscribers and we're still growing. So let's talk about why the US is in a transit mess and talk about how we got here and how we, meaning our generation, can be able to fix it following these steps. Alright, so I do apologize for the long absence. I had to leave wage cucking society and being an entrepreneur actually requires you to think. So I firmly believe that, look, if I can't help myself, I can't help anybody else. So this is why I have the goal of being able to do this so I can be able to be financially sufficient, to be able to be possible, to be able to dedicate more time to this endeavor of the American Rail Club and also keep putting out more videos because hopefully I can hire an editor because that's where probably 70% of my time comes into is editing these videos. And every time I have a schedule set up, this sh just happens and brings it all crashing down. At least my output, sanity, and happiness have all increased being outside of modern corporate America. And at least I'm not a Facebook contractor. Alright, now on to the show. Anybody saying that rail doesn't work in the United States and never will work is either lying, and it's a horribly convincing and terrible lie that's mired in misconception. It's like saying the final countdown is the song in Rocky IV when it's clearly hearts on fire. Clearly, rail has worked in the US, it still works, and in some other parts of the world it works fantastically. So let's talk money or let money talk, however you want to phrase it. US spending on infrastructure is heavily biased to my roads, and in the past several years, in the current administration, federal spending for funding transit, including rail, have increased, although much of that figure is still for stuff that isn't rail, like buses, etc. Long story short, the government doesn't put much effort, and never will, into creating high-speed rail or the mass transit systems that the US deserves and needs. This is one of the reasons why I've been a proponent for privatized passenger rail in this country. It's what built America and it's a superior operating and development structures. The best example can be seen in Italy, where a private high-speed rail company is more highly regarded, more modern, and runs on time as opposed to its government-run counterpart. And of course, the numerous Japanese rail companies which are all privately owned and operated. If you want to see more info about how that all works out in Japan, you can go ahead and click this video over here in the corner. It has over 200,000 views. A lot of the views have come over from Japanese viewers. To you we say, Arigato gozaimashita. Now it's not to say let's all privatize everything and government should hippity hoppity and get off our property. The problem is, is they've been all over it. In 2009, the Obama administration bailed out the auto industry, mainly garbage motors, with an $82 billion check, while the more rail-focused investment generating economic recovery program, that's an excuse of an acronym to spell TIGER, TIGER grants, those only got $4.2 billion of funding. Now in hindsight, it was a terrible choice and a testament to what happens when you have more government power. Unfortunately, there are some politicians that think the government should have more power. Now, for those of you who know, I'm unabashedly conservative, and that's an anomaly in transit advocacy. Then again, we have over 2 million total views and 13,000 subs, so we're living in strange times. The truth is, neither party cares about infrastructure enough, and the federal government is not going to do anything substantial for rail, despite both parties agreeing, yeah, things are broken. We should fix it, but they won't. The government gets an insane amount of tax revenue every year. That's over $3.5 trillion. It's like a four-year-old with five bucks who doesn't know what to do with it, and clearly anybody in charge of it is going to basically burn it. 
you can see another video I did on that concerning our priorities and that's linked over here. So you can go ahead and click that and watch that. In regards to operations now, the US is also very inefficient at that, at least for the last generation or two. The most relevant example is Amtrak, which until now for the past 50 years has only been able to get close to break even for its profits and spending. But, but Demetrius, Amtrak is terribly underfunded if it only had the monies. I absolutely agree. So let's venture over to California. The California High Speed Rail Authority has garnered up enough San Francisco street feces to become the ultimate pit storm. Now it's not news that the whole state is a complete disaster and a lot of people are saying hasta la vista to the red and golden state. So let it serve as a lesson. Number one, you can't highway build yourself out of traffic. There's a law that's called induced traffic that means the more lanes you build, the more traffic you're going to create. The other lesson is, is that if you have a pivotally important project, an incompetent state government should not be in charge. On top of generations spanning delays, millions and soon billions of dollars wasted, and constant attack from both the left and especially the right. Okay. That was epic. It's become the unfortunate scapegoat from the party that promised us a wall. Where, where is my wall? Okay, that was epic. Now, me personally moving from a state that had no income tax, aka Florida, to a state with income tax, aka Indiana, I've started to wonder, where is my money going to? After all, in the land of the free, you're not free to skip out on taxes and the IRS will happily come for you John Wick 3 style. Enter the state of Indiana, where the Hoosier State Service is dead as of June 30th. Now, Indiana is a pretty red state, so I should be pretty happy over here, right? But if modern American conservatism is about fiscal responsibility, lowering taxes, and lowering spending, and a free economy with competition, why is $3 million for a train in our own homeland not worth it? Yet, subsidizing a private company to fly directly from Indy over to Paris for 10 times the amount of money worth it. Oh, and that's out of a $21 billion state budget. Now, if you think the government as a whole is about fair and open competition, think again. Let's look at what happened in Texas in the 1980s. Southwest Airlines was okay with getting subsidies, but once a consortium of other companies formed planning to build a high-speed rail line, in direct competition with Southwest's main routes, and wanting some of that government gruel, Southwest was having none of it. So what did Southwest do? Successfully lobby to kill that project. It's obvious that across the spectrum, trains don't get a fair shake in this country. Now much of our infrastructural decay, hypocrisy, and cultural infanticide mostly comes at fault from the last generation. Okay, yeah, it's not the first time we've all heard how the boomers screwed it up for the rest of us and how we'll never be able to afford college for a couple hundred bucks a semester, be able to buy a house and get married at the age of 22, and never having to deal with another thousand depth riddled applicants for an entry level job that requires five years experience and a PhD. And it's equally true that GM and certain characters playing in the US government of the late 40s and 50s put in place our current system. While it's festered through the boomer age, nothing was done to fix it, just exacerbated. While America's connectivity was being destroyed, boomers wallowed naked in dirt for concerts. Oh no, traffic is getting worse. No problem, more lanes, paid for in courtesy of you, the taxpayer, and you have no choice over that comrade, I mean, <laughs> citizen, building a train? Well, gee, that's socialism. You're literal Nazis, and not in my backyard. Yes, we've gone over this multiple times, and if you happen to be a baby boomer that watches this channel and supports sensible infrastructure reform, thank you. And congratulations. Congratulations! Congratulations! Now, to my generation, the millennials. Despite being over-medicated, deeply in debt snowflakes, we've figured out, yeah, there's something wrong. For those of you millennials that are not indebted snowflakes calling their dogs fur babies, Thank you, and congratulations. Again, the current society, infrastructure, and the situation is 
falling apart. And while the boomers move into their containment facilities, we will have no one else to blame but ourselves, and this generation, if we do nothing. We have to realize that Bernie isn't going to absolve your college debt, and Trump isn't going to build our wall, although it would have been nice to have it along with Maglev on the top. The torch has been in our hands for a time now, we just have to figure out to stop screaming at the old dude smoking weed and riding his Harley to figure out that it's in our hands and, oh, we gotta do something about it. Now, with all that set up, we can go ahead into the steps of what we have to do to fix it and how we can bring high-speed rail in America. Step 1. Forget a massive federal plan. Look, it's been tried before and it's failed. Miserably. Every party and every president before has tried doing it. From LBJ and the High Speed Ground Transportation Act of 1965, to Obama and his plan that I nicknamed Sprinkles, I, I want to to Trump and the trillion dollar plan that neither party wants to work on. You go to China, they have trains that go 300 miles an hour. We have trains that go chug, chug, chug. We're not discounting DC entirely. We can probably get some help from some state reps and senators, but stop expecting any plan to come from DC and work. It's time to stop. It's time to stop, okay? No more. Step two. Go local. Your city, county, state, district, etc. are going to be the only ones capable of doing anything substantial for rail infrastructure. When I mean capable, it's not really based on brains, it's more based on the fact that they live next to their constituents, and they'd rather live next to happy ones, not angry ones. In other words, they don't live in a swamp fortress where when they're feeling down, they can go ahead and have a drink with their lobbyist buddies on K Street and sign away your sovereignty on a napkin. Now these local meetings that you're free to attend include any of these, for example, commission meetings, state department of transportation meetings, special meetings on transportation at your chamber of commerce, county meetings on right of way plans and transportation and more. Look on relevant websites for your city, county, district, state, local projects and local newspapers. It all depends on where you live. Infrastructure and transportation are political issues. There's no way around it. The best thing about it is that people really can't be bothered. So this is why these meetings are, well, practically empty. Especially if you live in a big city where, ironically, political involvement actually decreases. And if you're between the ages of 15 to 40, well, you'll easily be the youngest person in that meeting. And that also means you'll be more noticeable and your comment in the public forum will reach more ears and more audiences because of your age. And you'll have that much more of an impact. So. No pressure, but hey, pressure always decreases in this next step. Step three, make friends. Now you're either gonna be tempted to spurg out about some old time steam liner, or you're gonna want to start an uprising against the boomer proletariat because of how they can drone on about some really god awful ideas and misconceptions. This nightmare, we are going to be dying from it. Continue to report on the escalating number of these bomb trains spilling their contents, rupturing tank cars, exploding into fireballs, setting neighborhoods on fire, polluting waterways, and igniting fires that burn for days. And this is what it looks like. Bomb train. Bomb train. Bomb train. Bomb train. Bomb train. Don't. Because, congratulations, you've experienced why nothing gets done. Being passionate and young, or young at heart for some of our older viewers, will bring you attention. And attention brings friends. If you prepare your meetings the day before, dress appropriately, and come up with a comment that you've rehearsed for the public forum, it's usually something around two minutes or less, and it's gotta be understandable, you'll be able to make friends and acquaintances. Heck, you don't know how many people in their local community can't even name their mayor or commissioner. So you'll probably meet them at these meetings and you'll be able to make that much more of an impact and make acquaintances with them. I've recently made an acquaintance and had a pretty good discussion with my Indiana state senator about bringing high-speed rail into the state and into the region. The politicians and people in your state are always going to have more power and more leeway to do things in that state more so than Washington DC does. While on the subject of friends, you can go ahead and make a chapter of ARC at your local university or college and if you give me a contact, I'll go ahead and sponsor you as well. 
or you can chat with others in the art group, Transport Central Discord, and in your local area. Now again, these local meetings are underrepresented, so numbers do make a difference. It's also nice to have friends back you up when you start spilling dirt on corrupt politicians and their spending in front of their face, and then they stick the bailiffs on you. One, two, three, three arrested and disgraced mayors of North Miami Beach in a row. Ah, 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 ah. Great, so now those are the three simple steps to political involvement. We're getting good info here, and if you are and you think so, go ahead and like this video. If I go into any more detail, it's going to be too much, and again, this all differs in your area. And if you have specific questions, you're free to ask in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them when I stop being an entrepreneurial hermit. Now, how do these projects get built? Well, the simple answer is money. Everything needs money. We already discussed how the government has more than enough money to fix everything, so getting it to spend it on good things is going to be very, very hard. Which is why private ventures are going to be the way to go and have been the way things go for rail transportation in the US. Again, we're dealing with something that spends money on dumb and self-destructive things. Like a rehab patient, only your time and energy are going to be better well spent on a rehab patient with less problems and it's more localized in your area. Dealing with the federal one is a rehab patient that is on every known and unknown drug to man and Martian, frequent satanic rituals, and has an odd taste for pizza with baby flesh. That psycho is going to be left for another day. So for our rehab patient in our localized area, we're going to have to wean them off of spending money on dumb and self-destructive things and make them sane again. And the treatment for that is privatization. I had a talk with my local state senator and we both made some very good points of how we can use privatization to actually bring high speed rail and build it for not just the state of Indiana, but for the entire Midwest region. We've seen what happens in Florida with Brightline and what's going on with Texas. The problem is there's a lot of red tape and ordinances that actually make it pretty difficult for private ventures to actually run passenger rail lines in the US. Most of these are antiquated laws from when railroads used to be megacorps that your geriatric, hemp-smelling history teacher used to harp on about. To see how dumb and overreaching some of these laws are, let's take a look at Texas Central Railway, which is battling against the legalities of whether or not it can use eminent domain because, according to the opponents, get this, it's not a railroad. Honestly, I just want to open carry and LARP as Jesse McCree on an N700. Is that... Too much to ask for? This is why political involvement is needed on your part to fix this. The government won't have the competence and the willpower to actually do so. So they always go the easy route and throw money at what they know. Like smoking carcinogens and getting high. Our job is to give a third option, the train, a chance in this country. Now the money for a railroad is a different story. And there's three ways it can be done. Number one have money. Virgin Brightline would not exist if Florida East Coast did not have the money, bonds, and credit to get it going. Now you don't have to be a class 2 railroad or Richard Branson to actually get this going. Depending on where you live and how much of a richy rich you are, you may not even have to do much to actually make the money. After all, look at how much the Hyperloop scams have already garnered to run over glorified science camp projects. Again, this is part of the reason why I quit the corporate wage cuck life has a very low chance of getting me to that goal, and it isn't going to support me willingly in doing so. Does that mean every millennial should become an entrepreneur? No. But then again, take a look at the example of Richard Branson, who never held a typical job and started with his magazine, record shop, and later record label, and then turned it into a mega empire and was all starting out as a teenager, so yes, it's possible. Option two is to no money. And that's where we look at Texas Central Railway. Now, it's not operating yet, and nobody there is super duper mega rich. However, they do know somebody that has the experience and has a lot of money to spend, and that is the Central Japan Railway Company. They are pouring in a great amount of not just money, but support and expertise to make sure this project works and gets through all the legal hurdles and the land of the free to free people from traffic. This is why making friends is important. You not only bring to light the importance of rail transportation to other circles, but you also get into more influential and, yes, richer circles. 
Now, many great companies would not have existed if it were not for the founders making friends in different circles, like Google and Amazon. Then there is option three, which is to create money. And I don't mean by printing it out because that's illegal, at least for us peons. By creating money, we mean by creating a market and creating demand. By getting out there, getting involved, going to meetings and meeting people and starting coalitions and groups, the word starts to get out by multiple mediums. As more people become aware that they don't have to sit in traffic for hours or have their sanity destroyed by the airlines and that there's actually cool rail transportation that exists in this planet and we can actually build it over here, we create demand and a market. If you create demand or market that has a problem that can be solved, you see that investors, private ventures and entrepreneurs worth their salt will see the problems that can be solved because that means that they can charge people X amount of dollars to solve their problem and both parties are happy. Then our super awesome Rail Central uses that money to make the service better and customers are happier. That friends is actual capitalism. On the other hand, we have lean, mean, and canning people like Sardines Airlines fleecing customers to spend X amount of money to use their service, then using X money to tell politicians to make an actual solution impossible, therefore making money, making people unhappy but forced to use their service because they have no other logical choice, and creating a government-supported monopoly. The first solution is home of the free, land of the brave, the second is bullshit. Option three is actually very attainable, and that's where most of us watching this can actually start on. And that means starting by getting out there, start getting political, and start creating a knowledgeable audience in demand of a real solution. When you see the people and problems we're up against, it may seem impossible, but if our worthless public indoctrination was right about anything, it's that it only takes one person to actually start something and follow through to make a difference. It can be for both good and bad, but I firmly believe we're doing something good here by giving our generation and future ones a chance to have another option to move around in the country in a viable industry to work and grow in and a chance to really make America's railroads great again. One way you can help out is by subscribing and sharing this video. We're at 13,000 subscribers and getting up there and hopefully we can go ahead and reach 20,000 subscribers with your help. And if you're new here and if you've been here for a while, welcome aboard. You can also join Patreon, buy apparel like these cool t-shirts on Teespring to support us. Not only do they look cool, you stand out in public, may get you the ladies. Especially for the 92% guys who are watching this channel, you can try this one. Hey, how about a ride on this train? We'll be out with another video soon, so be sure to subscribe and let me know what you think in the comments below. We'll see you next time.